how many people are online kavi at the moment how many are right there right now on youtube there are six i just started the live stream okay and people should join okay right but this uh, this will be available offline also right yeah yeah i have also posted a tweet right now so so the yeah so live stream is on uh, so i think we should get started sure uh, so uh, welcome everyone for this uh, kavi's corner session and uh, this uh, session is mainly focused uh, to understand uh, or bring awareness with respect to just management and uh, agriculture uh, uh, scenarios in india uh, so uh, we'll get started uh, so first uh, professor kavi arya will give an introduction as to what this session is going to be and he will briefly introduce our guests today and then from there on we can take it forward and towards the end we'll have a q and a uh, so there is q and a all pretty enabled so if you have questions on the uh, fly please post it there and we'll answer it uh, as and when possible over to you kavi sir thank you very much hi my name is uh, kavi arya i am a professor in the computer science department of iit bombay and i am also the principal investigator of e yantra so i'd like to welcome you today to this uh, little program where we have two esteemed guests with us and the purpose of this program is to animate the discussion around the e yantra innovation challenge for which the registrations are on now uh, until the 29th of uh, september but before that let me just tell you what the purpose of this entire exercise is and what e yantra is about in just a few brief words so e yantra is an outreach technology outreach project uh, hosted at iit bombay funded by the ministry of education and it is trying to empower many many students across the country in engineering colleges polytechnics and so on and it does it through three initiatives it has one initiative is called the e yantra lab setup initiative which sets up labs in an engineering college in order to change the culture of a college to one of innovation and entrepreneurship you know students believe even now that if you just pass exams you'll get a job that's not the case anymore uh, employers and the world is looking for much much more than just an employee who has to be told what to do they are looking for young people who are entrepreneurial who are curious who are willing to pick up interesting problems to solve who are problem solvers who are entrepreneurial in the way they engage with life whether it's inside an organization or outside an organization so that kind of animal if you like want of a better word e yantra tries to create by complementing our education system with problem based learning project based learning all these kind of things so the lab is a very important component of that along with the lab we have two competitions whose purpose is to train students these are not pure competitions where we just assess your your preparedness in a subject or a topic these competitions are moocs they actually train you in skills okay over a period of 6 months so one competition is the yantra robotics competition which trains you in technology stacks uh one stack for instance could be how to build and fly a drone another stack could be geographical information systems as to how to make sense of google maps and do mapping based applications another could be a control system stack where we teach you complex controls how to balance a motorbike right 3d build uh, a 3d model bike which you balance and then you negotiate around an arena and other could be chip design where we train you how to program field programmable gate arrays which is reconfigurable hardware using languages like verilog so we train you in te- in technology and the outcome we find from data is that students get placed at almost 50 to 100% higher salaries than people who don't have this experience students are encouraged to do higher degrees which is very good or students spontaneously do startups or join startups right which we are very happy about so it really changes the culture so the robotics competition trains you in basic technology skills and then this the e yantra innovation challenge trains you how to use technology to solve society problems and in the process we train you how to look for an interesting problem and then how do you solve the problem by building a proof of concept a poc and then we teach you how to pitch this to an incubator so it's an end to end kind of training that e yantra gives you 
Now, what is this all about? For this, I will hark back to the G20 session that we curated in, on the 18th of August at the G20 summit in Varanasi on the invitation of the Ministry of Youth Affairs. So in our 75 minute session on uh, the future of work and job creation, we essentially told this story that technology and automation is going to reduce legacy jobs in all spheres, in manufacturing, software, copywriting, media, and so on. They're going to reduce jobs. So what do we do? So we said that the Indian economy is growing exponentially. There are lots of opportunities if you have the appetite for them. And there are opportunities in various fields like manufacturing, like healthcare, like software and agriculture and all sorts of things, right? But those jobs need a different mindset and Iyantra creates that mindset. And we had a guest there, a friend who's the co-founder of Sahyadri Farms, uh, which is a 1,000 crore agricultural business in uh, Nasik. And uh, Azhar Tambuwala showed all the opportunities that exist in agriculture. Similarly, today, we have two very esteemed guests of ours who will populate two areas for us to give you an idea of the kind of innovation that you can do in these areas. And we are hoping that the students who listen to these uh, two speakers of ours will be inspired to look for interesting problems to solve, which can result in proofs of concept, which can result potentially in startups, or at least some interesting research that they can do or be projects or what have you. So I'd like to introduce Professor Vinod Menon and uh, Sriram Parthasarthi here. And I'd like to uh, introduce them both first before uh, asking them some uh, questions which would be useful to you. Uh, is Kavi sir audible? Uh, I think uh, he has got this. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Uh, he is back. Yeah. Kavi, you're back. You're muted. Sir, we lost you for. Uh, you're muted. We lost you for five, uh, two minutes. No, no. What is this? Uh, we lost you for two minutes. Okay, fine. I'm back now. Okay. Yeah. So essentially, we have Professor Vinod Menon here with 37 years of professional experience in training, research, and consulting, where he specialized in disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, public policy analysis, and all that for the last 25 years. He's a UN staff member. He's a founding member of the National Disaster Management Authority of India. And he's he had the status of a union minister of state in that. He's, the, he's a regional director for Asia at the International Emergency Management Society in Oslo. And he's an adjunct prof at Amrita University and an advisor to the School of Sustainable Development. And he's got a number of other credits like this to himself. He's a governing board member of Swayam Shikshan Prayog. And he's a member of many advisory boards. But more importantly, he's a good friend of Iyantra. He's a personal friend. And we had a wonderful uh, uh, a time a few years ago when we took him to Bhutan with us and a bunch of, uh, of other exports, experts to investigate whether young people without any exposure to these kind of ideas could be exposed to disaster management ideas over a few days and then come up with innovative resolutions to them and that 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 three-day workshop showed us that there's a lot that young people can do so you're only limited by your imagination so that's professor vinod menon then sriram parthasarthi is an interesting guy he's a banker originally and he's bank uh, he's been a banker with barclays anz stand chart and he's been the country head of a german bank west lb at one time so and after that after almost 16 years in banking he went into agriculture and he's got 13 years of extensive experience in the agricultural sector from 2010 to 2020. And he himself was a farmer for three years where he was an entrepreneur building farm to fork a supply chain for uh, 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 fruits and vegetables for almost about five years. And he specialized in perishable fruits and vegetables. And, prior, and, and he's got wide experience, but 
broadly in finance, where he's been a specialist in in uh, project uh, finance, and he's been one of the leading financiers in the telecom, energy, mining, and all these sectors. And in agriculture, he's got a deep understanding of the agricultural sector in India. So he's someone who's got corporate experience, finance experience, and agricultural experience at the grassroots level. So I thought it would be great for him to join us to give an idea of the kind of opportunities that exist. So we'll start with uh, uh, with uh, Professor Menon. <clears throat> so Professor Menon, we have 10 minutes or whatever here. I thought that you could give us a, uh, an idea of what young people like who we have here is faculty and students from engineering colleges. Right? I'll call you back. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So, you know, we have faculty and students from engineering colleges and they would be very interested to, to understand what they can do at their level with the kind of skill sets that they have, with the kind of training that they have, aided and abetted by the training that we give them in exploring opportunities in disaster management. That means what kind of ideas, what kind of opportunities exist in doing some innovation to help this disaster management area with the kind of skills that they have, which is software, web, uh, uh, embedded systems, internet of things, and uh, GIS, and all those kind of things. So over to you, Vinod. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, for the faculty members and students of engineering uh, from different institutions in India, uh, from the IITs, uh, NITs, engineering colleges, and also uh, other technical institutions. Uh, I'm actually very fond of uh, the initiative which Professor Kaviaria and his team, Iyantra, has been doing uh, after I came into contact with him and the team uh, four years ago. And I feel that actually uh, the challenge is to really look at uh, the problems and look at solutions using information technology tools. And we have seen that uh, enormous potential exists in trying to look at uh, IT uh, solutions, uh, information technology solutions, especially using IoT or embedded systems or GIS solutions and many others, including artificial intelligence now, because we are seeing the whole uh, game of uh, uh, problem solving is actually changing with uh, artificial intelligence solutions also. So I think when you really look at uh, disaster management, the, the bottom line of disaster management is that anything can happen anytime, anywhere. And we know that right now, while we're talking, uh, the uh, people in Morocco faced a very devastating earthquake. And we saw that uh, in Derna, in Libya, there was a devastating flood which happened and then two dams have burst and then an entire city of Derna has actually faced a uh, huge devastation. So these kind of challenges are happening. And then you have conflicts happening in Sudan and many other countries in Africa and also in, um, in Europe. We have seen a lot of refugee movements of people trying to find you know, uh, asylum in other countries, basically in search of jobs, in search of employment and income and so on. So when you look at disaster management, it's essentially disasters climate change induced hydrometeorological disasters, extreme events, or even uh, conflicts. So what are the solutions possible? You know, you know that engineering students and uh, engineering firms and entrepreneurs come up with sensors, come up with uh, various uh, uh, solutions using either the chips and R&D in innovative solutions in robotics and many other uh, tools which they're actually using. You also see communication solutions which are being tried through Raspberry Pi and others. Uh, and we find that even uh, early warning solutions are possible for all kinds of disasters. And now the United Nations has been talking about early warning solutions for all by 2030. And uh, they have actually put together uh, about $3.8 billion, billion with a B, for solutions in early warning. And when we find that these kind of solutions are possible, if you can actually look at sensors for looking at flood levels uh, or rainfall patterns using artificial, uh, you know, uh, solutions, uh, automatic weather stations, uh, artificial intelligence solutions, machine learning solutions, big data analytics, geoinformatics, and so on. 
So we have a lot of opportunities. And when we really look at that, I think uh, we have even seen uh, large multinational corporations like Google or uh, IBM or Microsoft uh, or Apple trying to look at uh, problem solving solutions using uh, tools like uh, Person Finder. When you find people are missing in disasters, in large crowds and things so that, you know, you use Person Finder to use what is called uh, uh, crisis map solutions. And right now there is a huge crowdsourcing uh, solution for uh, mapping using hot OSM, open street maps and so on uh, in Morocco and also in Libya. And we know that even when the MH270, uh, uh, the uh, Malaysian Airlines uh, disappeared, there was also a crowdsourcing initiative where people are all trying to find where is the plane because you know this plane went missing. And so there's a huge effort and we've seen drones being used for looking at wildfires in California or in Greece or in many other countries. So using drones, using geoinformatic solutions, using remote sensing, satellite imagery, the opportunities are endless. And so when we really look at the solutions, like what uh, Professor Kaviaria said, employment generation is possible if you can have innovative solutions for problem solving. And you can have startup solutions and there are many incubators so we have many opportunities and i think you know we will be able to take up some of these when we have questions and answers also i'll pause now and if there are any questions we can take it up later thanks Vinod. that's very good <clears throat> you kind of laid it out a bit uh, in the question and answers we can go into the details maybe of the sorts of disasters and the kind of innovative solutions that can come from people now most students feel that you know it is it is some specially endowed people who create all these you know interesting products and services and all that but i'd like to remind them that each person has a unique perspective as to how to solve a particular problem and there's no guarantee that somebody else might have even thought of it and that's because Technology has changed a lot, situations have changed a lot, infrastructure has changed a lot, and there are constantly new opportunities all the time for solving a problem in a manner that was not possible even three, four, five years ago. Okay, so the, it's a, and, and people should not underestimate the value that they can bring to solve a problem because they might have a very unique perspective to it, which might lead to something really special. So I think you, started off an interesting line but we'd like to carry it through later on with uh, talking about specific disasters like say floods or uh, when we went to bhutan you remember bhutan has got 5000 glacial lakes and what's happening because global warming climate change is bringing more melt water down into these lakes and these lakes are are, are uh, breaching their barriers and they're flooding entire valleys and villages and stuff like that so even a very simple solution like putting a depth sensor in a lake and from time to time reporting the the depth of the water in the lake can tell you when the water is reaching a dangerously high level when it might cause a breach something like this would be extremely helpful to save lots of lives similar things could happen in other places you know flood warning systems in a city like mumbai nobody tells us whether so and so area is flooded or not until you actually take your car out and you get stuck even in Bombay, we don't have these kind of things. And this might be so in other cities also. So I'm saying that we are only limited by our imagination as to what are the things that we can sense and to bring that together in a kind of a solution. So similarly, uh, so one thing common between disaster management and agriculture is that agriculture is a sphere which has lots of disasters. <laughs> and farmers know that. And you're a victim of climate. You're a victim of uh, of or the vagaries of climate, and uh, you need a similar kind of mindset to be able to survive, right? Uh, 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 apart from other things, apart from climate, survive agriculture itself. So I was speaking to Sri Ram a bit earlier on. I said, let us be focused. In fact, he encouraged me. Why don't we be focused about what are the specific things that 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 students can actually help with? with their current skill set. So uh, I think I'll leave the floor to him to kind of uh, give an idea of what he's got in his mind. 
of the kinds of problems which could be tackled by students which are doable and which would cause a lot of benefit to the agricultural community. So it will be good if you just give an idea from farm to fork, what is the kind of chain and then from there you can give an idea of what are the kind of uh, things, interventions that we could do. Over to you, Sridhar. Thank you, Professor Arya. It's a privilege to be here uh, with the Yantra team and also to present to the faculty and students from the various colleges from across India. Uh, it's, I think, uh, Yantra is a very interesting initiative and I'm happy to be you know, helping along with that. So, to cut to the chase, the, as far as agriculture is concerned, okay, it is a very, very vast area, okay? It, well, in, in, uh, in India, agriculture is roughly estimated to be about 18% of the GDP. So, in real terms, that is about $600 billion plus of value which is generated from agriculture, right? it is probably larger than most of the other sectors. It is agriculture today is probably larger than the IT sector. It is probably as big as the manufacturing sector in India. So it is indeed quite large. But that also means that there is a chance of kind of getting sidetracked into a lot of these challenges that the sector faces and, and get caught up in, in the whole process of things that are too complex. So I think what we need to focus on is, is that the end of the day, the pro this EANTRA project is kind of, you know, for students from the various engineering colleges. So one of the key things therefore is that we need to kind of cut down the problems and the areas in agriculture into bite-sized problems which can be tackled by the students here. So the, the key thing here is that the, these, are, these have to be problems which can be addressed in the couple of months of limited time that you have within which you have to kind of develop this project, right? So let me kind of, what I will, try to do is a outline the uh, range of activities that happen in agriculture and give you a few hints as to what people can focus on so agriculture broadly you know we talk about the farming process the pre-farming process as in what happens when you have to kind of prepare the uh, land and soil for the farming process itself which also includes uh, understanding the soil components, whether there is water, what are the kind of uh, fertilizers that need to be added, what kind of farm mechanization needs to be used to kind of prepare the soil. So all of that comes under the pre-farm process. Then is the phase of farming itself, where the farmer kind of uses plants, various agricultural crops, whether it is food grains, whether it's fruits and vegetables, and then harvest the produce okay then is the post harvest process where once the produce is harvested how is it transported from the farm to the various markets which are called also called as mandis uh, in india and from there how does it how is it stored how is it transported how does it get to the processors, how does it get to the customers? So that is the whole agricultural chain. And within this, there are numerous problems that can be addressed to uh, so, uh, solve some of the problems. Now, remember one thing, I, when we talk about problems in agriculture, it is not only the problems faced by the farmer. That's very important to understand because the moment we talk about agriculture, everyone starts thinking farmer. What also happens is that you need to focus on the problems that happen after the produce leaves the farm till it gets to the consumer. In India, that's one of the areas where there is a huge challenge and 
because if the value is not preserved through that chain till the produce gets to the customer the farmer will never get the price for that so it is also important to preserve the value of the produce after it leaves the farm so that some part of the value can also go to the customer through a better price and or or a lower price and better quality to the customer and a better price to the farmer so we need to get a look at the whole range of activities and break it down into small bits which can be solved here now that's all the theory part of it now let me give you some examples of what are the kind of problems that can be addressed here and and look there are a number of these problems which may have already been solved but i think what this process entails this e yantra process is encouraging students to innovate think in different ways and create solutions right so even if there is a solution which already exists what students here could also do is take the student the solution which exists and adapt it for a local use in your community or around your community state wherever it it is it can be applied right so let me give you an example so you know this uh, uh, i was talking to kavi arya earlier and one of the things that we talked about is way back in uh, around 2010 2011 when i was doing farming they already and smartphones were not even in you know uh, wide use at that stage people had already innovated to create solutions like for example what happens in the rural areas is that the place where the farmer lives might be some distance away from the actual farm right the water pump for the farm might be maybe a couple of kilometers away from the farmer's house and what happens is that let's say he has to kind of uh, switch on the water in the farm every time he has to keep going up and down so there was actually a solution at that time where you had a, a small device fitted to the uh, pump and you kind of give a missed call on that and put a particular code punch in a particular code this is the feature phones not even the smartphones you punch in a particular code and the pump will start and you uh, call the uh, same number and punch in a different code the pump will shut down so these kind of uh, solutions existed even in the pre smartphone era so i'm sure similar things can be adapted to the users in today's environment as well but one of the again this i should have mentioned earlier but one of the key things relating to innovation is that understanding who is the person you are innovating for do not start with the technology or do not start with the equipment first always look at who is this that you are solving the problem for talk to them understand what is the exact problem and through that you might actually learn that the way to address that problem could be completely different from the way you thought i can i cannot emphasize enough the importance of talking to your stakeholder or your customer as they say you know i i kind of you know i was a banker for 16 years and then i kind of uh, did farming and started my entrepreneurial but believe me the amount i learned from my talking to my customers that actually helped me reshape my entire business and make it more acceptable to the customer so let me kind of emphasize that again saying that talk to the people around you so coming back to the solutions there are all kinds of solutions let's say you know one of the things that people talk about is uh, india needs a lot more cold chain right 
but then cold chain is expensive can everyone kind of uh, you, you know put up a cold store and, and stuff like that these cost a couple of lakhs of rupees so there is there is already a solution but there's absolutely no harm in you guys kind of trying this as well there was a i during the days i was farming again this is 2010 2011 i came across a farmer a indian punjabi farmer in the us who had created a device a small device which bypassed the thermostat in a room air conditioner because a normal room air conditioner will not cool down the temperature below 16 to 17 uh, degrees whereas if you want it to use it as a cold in a cold store you need to bring it below 10 degrees maybe even uh, 5 or 6 degrees so what he had done is that used a device to bypass the thermostat in the uh, normal air conditioner so that it can cool down a ro- small room in the village to maybe 4 5 degrees also right it's it's not very complicated the only thing you need to co- keep in mind is that how do you bring down the temperature but kind of uh, also manage the frosting issue right simple things like that uh these are kind of things so the first one i kind of talked about first example of of how you switch on and switch off pumps is the pre farm or or during the farming activity right uh something like this is the supply chain activity right let me give you another example in let's say fruits okay you have various fruits you have uh, let's take watermelon right now we all lo- love to eat watermelon but then how do you know whether a watermelon is ripe or not you all like a ripe red watermelon but sometimes you also end up with a white one if it is not fully ripe how do you ensure that the watermelon that you are purchasing or the farmer is selling to the wholesale market and the which the uh, local vendor is buying from the wholesale market is fully ripe now what typically happens is that the farmer takes the watermelon and taps it like this and it produces a certain sound and based on that they estimate whether it is ripe or is it going to be hard right what does that indicate it indicates that if there is a slightly hollow sound that means the fruit has ripened if it is hard from inside that means you will get a slightly hard sound now can you use a small device like a which which you transmits a sound or a ultrasound something a small torch like device which when you kind of ping it on a particular fruit whether it could be a watermelon it could be a mango it could be any other and and the uh, and it will determine whether it is ripe the fruit is ripe or not uh, obviously understanding that the uh, the kind of sound and and the skin thickness in a watermelon is different from say a, a chiku or a mango so you need to kind of make adjustments for that because what that will do is that it will help both the farmer sell his produce and the customers get a better quality produce right and therefore create value along the chain so there are simple solutions like this which students can think about and develop but you know even if you could have just take a walk around the market and you see how customers behave go to the wholesale market in your respective town see how people buy and how the trade happens talk to the farm uh, people who come there to sell the produce talk to the traders in the uh, wholesale market talk to the uh, uh, street side vendors customers you'll get a whole lot of ideas in terms of what are the things that can be done and i'm telling you in terms of you know these are basic ideas which are good to develop as projects in in a student environment but that aside there is a lot of innovations which are kind of being done as we speak by various startups in the agricultural sector so some of those also you could look at and see how you can add value to that so those are some of the thoughts we can kind of talk about more in the q and a session thanks sir shriram for that um I think this is a nice way that we've got. We are also on time in the uh, way we wanted to uh, play this out, and we wanted to give some time for question and answers. 
so uh, like you said right uh, in this whole uh, spa uh, space of uh, of vegetable storage right so you said the innovative ways to bring the cost down of these cold rooms by by doing jugad with acs is like doing uh, jugad with uh, with upright washing machines to make uh, lassi in punjab which the punjabis also Absolutely. discovered right <laughs> and uh, there's so much to be done in fact i have a colleague uh, professor arora in uh, in iit bombay who's been working on this whole whole area of onion storage you know if you have a single bad onion in your store it can spoil the rest of the thing because it lets out ethylene gas or whatever it is mm. so they've been looking at uh, ways and sensors which they can plant in onion storage uh, barns so as to uh, assess when the onions are beginning to uh, spoil and that can save your entire harvest that you've got there right so onion storage and for that matter any storage of any vegetables or fruit or produce or whatever it is right so storage is one idea transportation right transporting them and uh, checking ripeness i think this is very interesting in fact i've often seen a coconut vendor knocks on the nariyal in order to check how thick the malai is or whether there is water or whatever it is and i'm sure that by the weight of the coconut he can he can sense whether it has got lots of water or little water because the fiber is very light around it and by knocking it he can see what the thickness of uh, of the malai inside it so i've often thought about doing some investigation into this and if people are near a village which processes lots of coconuts that's a great place to devise some machine learning algorithms you know because they normally break these coconuts to uh, to extract the water or the fiber or whatever it is and if they are processing a large number of coconuts these guys can do an estimate of the amount of water and malai and all that in these things and build up a lot of data with which they can do machine learning algorithms which can can uh, be extremely useful the other thing is grading grading is very important in mandis cool. right sorting vegetables based on color on size and these kind of things these are very easily done with the help of very basic mechatronics or 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 embedded systems with devices in fact i remember in my embedded systems course students used our uh, firebird robot to do a prototype in just 4 weeks they built a prototype which can sort lemons yellow lemons green lemons so you have a hopper and they drop lemons down into a bin and then you have a webcam which is doing open cv uh, image processing based on that they will have a paddle which can move the lemon into uh, one bin or the other in fact i like lohit here who's uh, Uh, our phd student uh, talk about a little bit about the work that he's doing so he's doing pest attack prediction in chili plants right using satellite data and local sensors and those kind of things so this pest pest prediction is very important okay and pest spraying people are already doing with uh, drones and stuff like that but remote sensing of various kinds with drones and in fact a colleague of mine from isro tapan mishra he is the father of uh, sar synthetic aperture radar which are these big radars carried in uh, satellites with which they do uh, uh, radar imaging of 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 the earth through which they can check uh, things like plantations of various kinds and various other things uh, on the surface of the earth now he is retired from isro and he's got a startup in west bengal where he is making small sar radars which are drone bound right so he can now fly a drone and at a fraction of the cost get very high resolution imagery of agricultural fields so these are the kind of things that that are beginning to happen now because technology is advancing so fast high and powerful processing is becoming cheaper and cheaper so you are just limited by your imagination so in fact uh, there a lot of these things uh, exist in fact uh, there is a bangalore based company called cropin what they okay. do is that uh, they uh, one of the things that's also been happening over the years is that the cost of satellite imagery has been coming down significantly satellite images are are lot cheaper so what they do is use satellite imagery and they have trained uh, their their uh, algorithms 
to identify and using past uh, historical data the, uh, and they've got machine learning algorithms which now are able to look at these uh, satellite images and identify on a particular geotagged farm what is being grown what stage is this crop in is this the early stage mid stage uh, late stage is the crop growing based on the quality of the crop good medium bad is there any pest infestation all of these can be identified from a satellite image using machine learning and this is this is kind of you know being used by corporations across the world they they kind of actually uh, uh, have more global customers than uh, customers in India. In India also, they have a lot of customers. But this this kind of stuff is already happening, and and this is cutting edge stuff, right? The thing is that I didn't want to kind of mention all of this in the context of of uh, the students because that kind of takes them on a com completely tangential kind of a thing. And whereas I think we need to kind of give them bite sized chunk of what uh, robotic devices that they could work with no no sridam i think i think this is very useful i'll tell you why because we've had instances where see in this yantra innovation challenge it is a faculty mentor which works with uh, three or four students right right, right. come up with an innovation we've had one faculty his name is uh, rohan vaidya in uh, vincent pelotti college in nagpur mm -hmm. he in working with the students to come up with an innovative idea for the uh, the Eantra innovation challenge, they came across an interesting problem, which now he's picked it up as his PhD problem. So right. now he's pursuing his PhD based on that problem. So I'm That's saying right. that th this whole process hmm. of identifying interesting problems to solve is where the value is created in society. Right. It's the people who own the problem who actually make the money because this is oh. Apple, for instance. The problem with India is that most of us, most of our software company are realizing other people's dreams. <laughs> right. And they own the intellectual property. We are just building it out for them. So ours right. is low margin work. They actually own the IP and they are making high margins. So we want our students to be able to look at problems as opportunities and build True. the technology themselves. And I'd like to remind them that our, our study and our experience shows that anything that you build in India, you can build at one eighth, one eighth of the cost that it could be available for abroad. So that's a fantastic, even if you find that a product exists abroad, if you build an Indian version of that, which is good for our Indian applications, you can build it for one eighth of the cost and you'll find not only an Indian market, but you'll find an African market. South, in fact, the global South will buy it from you. In, right? in fact, a lot of the innovators from India, they actually kind of, you know, find that it is a lot easier to sell overseas and get better revenue yes. than within India. And and like for example, this company I mentioned, Cropin, right? They initially kind of they they today kind of get a lot more revenue from because once you've solved the problem which in Indian context, you're kind of pretty much able to kind of use it anywhere across the globe. In fact, we are trying to leverage Yantra as a global platform by going global and using this as a platform to connect Indian kids with kids abroad. Hopefully that will lead to startups with people from here, people from there. We want to bring them to IIT Bombay for internships and get them to know each other and it's all, all that kind of stuff. Because I think this is the software companies are making their money from abroad. Indian markets are very difficult to crack, right? And if you have a good product, I think it's a good idea to look at exporting abroad. In fact, one of our Eantra startups, uh, Catamaran Robotics, by uh, and founded by Muthu Bangaliapan and 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 other uh, co-founders, is a robotics company based out of Coimbatore. They have 115 engineers, and Muthu came up through the Eantra Robotics competition. Then he came to an internship, and we said, Muthu, don't take a job, do a startup, or go for a higher degree. He actually did a startup, and he sells security robots to condominium societies in Singapore. 50 condominium societies have his robots, right? Where he's, his value proposition is that you have 10 security guards, we can do the work with six, and the work of four will be done by my robots. And he has a control room in Coimbatore, which is monitoring those campuses in Singapore. 
He's got delivery robots in seven star hotels, which autonomously take luggage from the lounge right up to the person's room by autonomously controlling the elevator, getting into the elevator, uh, getting off at the right floor and going to the room. So I'm saying that we are just limited by our imagination. Our students don't know that very often. You know, if they can apply their mind to it and believe they can do it, I'm certain that they will be able to do it and they'll get all the help from us that they want. So I'd like to open the floor here to uh, the audience and uh, people on YouTube can perhaps uh, uh, comment on the chat. And we have about 10, 15 minutes to answer your questions. It'll be very good to hear from you. And we are open to questions. Yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please do ask in the chat box. Uh, if you want to ask question, you can raise your hand. I'll unmute you. By default, everyone is on mute. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hand. I think or this is by default. Speak. You can unmute everybody now, no? Uh, we can, but uh, since we are going live, we'll like to. Okay. Because there are other few uh, doubts with regard yes. to yes. you guys. Yes. So if they just put it on the chat, I think that's a good start. Yep. So while they are warming up with their uh, questions and all that, I'd like to get back to Vinod uh, Menon. So we did a, a three-day disaster workshop at the College of Science and Technology in Funcholing four years ago, and that's when we met uh, Vinod. And we wanted to go there to see what Eyantra can do to Bhutanese students. So we asked the Bhutanese, what is the most important problems that you face? And they said disasters, because whenever it is monsoon every year, they get landslides and then the country is disconnected because most of the traffic goes by road. And from Funcholing to Paro and Thimpu and all that, it gets very difficult to travel. So the students came up with amazing solutions, right? They came up with the, the solutions like putting optical fiber in the in the, uh, the road sides of the mountains in in uh, stretches which are prone to uh, uh, to landslides. And they say that by monitoring the light signal at two ends of an optical fiber cable, if the cable bends a little bit, right? that can be detected at the sensor at the other end and it warns you that there's there's some movement happening which is not good okay various ideas like that some people came up with an idea of cattle monitoring because they believe that animals get they can sense earthquakes and things like that before they happen so if you monitor animals that can be an early warning system for you Right, which is a very innovative idea actually and the Japanese I think there are some patents out for this kind of technology. So someone is asking here Mr. Siddhar Jain what key problems are common with agriculture as well as disaster management. Now this is a smart guy he says I want to build a solution which is useful for both disaster management <laughs> and agriculture. Um, any ideas we know things uh, that okay. that um, Okay, I was just I was just thinking about that when Sridham was talking because uh, you know in Maharashtra we used to have uh, uh, cut flowers which are being sent for auctions in Europe. Okay, and uh, always the problem was that you know how do you really make sure that uh, the cut flowers can actually reach uh, in, in time sensitive uh, uh, in uh, you know air traffic and also transit across different uh, cities and then reach a certain place. And what's the kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, truck trucking which is required where, you know, we will actually be able to make sure that the flowers don't really start wil wilting when it is actually moving from one location to Mumbai. And then from Mumbai, it's actually airborne and then going into another city and so on. This is one problem uh, in terms of uh, containerizing. The other issue is in terms of warehousing, as was, was already mentioned, and also the question of uh, preparing for uh, drought situations when water becomes really scarce. You know, when a rainfall becomes scanty, what is the kind of uh, preparedness which is possible? So how do you really anticipate a long uh, drawn drought situation which can actually you know, be harmful for livestock as well as for human beings? Uh, and for crops. So what are the kind of solutions which are possible? So weather patterns and looking at all this. And I think, you know, if you really look at uh, the age composition of the population, 
there are people who are actually elderly there are people who are young there are people who are actually also uh, women who are dependent on the farms so what is the kind of solutions which actually can be possible to make sure that uh, they are actually able to withstand shocks whether it is uh, economic shocks like uh, you know sudden uh, rise of uh, prices and then you know like petrol when the, the russian war in ukraine actually started having impact in terms of a global uh, change in the petroleum prices and because of the shortage and so on so what are the kind of solutions which are possible both in terms of uh, making sure that uh, you have shortage which has to be addressed and then you know if there is a shortage it, it's a supply driven kind of a solution which has to be also seen as a demand driven opportunity you know if there is a shortage which is going to happen you know are, are the people going to anticipate uh, uh, sudden rise in prices and then start uh, hoarding uh, materials including vegetables and fruits and so on uh, especially if there is an impending conflict and things are going to be missing uh, food grains for instance you know when uh, we know that the war in ukraine has actually upset uh, uh, food grain marketing from ukraine because ukraine has been one of the major storehouses for uh, uh, the european countries for supply of food grains so they, these are all possibilities which we may need to really look at and i think uh, you know we also need to really look at whether and whether you mentioned this question of using sar uh, synthetic aperture radars and uh, you mentioned uh, tapan is actually doing drone mounted uh, sar uh, equipments so there are these uh, uh, synthetic aperture radars which are actually persistent scatterer interferometry uh, using synthetic aperture radars what is called ps insar there are also differential sars uh, d insar and also we have what is called uh, uh, normal insar which is uh, the interferometric uh, synthetic aperture radars what it does is that you know it is able to anticipate uh, the deformations which can be caused before a disaster during a disaster and after a disaster like you have this uh, floods in libya which are caused by, and resulted in two dams which are breaking okay so if you actually can look at uh, the satellite imagery before the event satellite imagery during the event and satellite imagery after the event you might actually have some better analysis useful you know why yep. give such difficult uh... problems kuch kuch aasan problem nahi hai isme the aasan <laughs> problem yeah very these simple are, these are very, very, very interesting simple. they need a lot of data and is slightly research grade also no very simple right. problems can be using uh, rainfall data and then seeing whether a, a river is likely to have flooding or a dam is likely to start crossing this danger signal danger mark and then you know water has to be released and if water has to be released how do you make sure that you know this water is actually not going to inundate uh, agricultural fields and then villages and then they get destroyed uh, they get damaged and infrastructure gets damaged so i think we need to really look at sensors you know how sensors will be able to look at uh, some of these problems so if in a lake which is actually a water body can you really look at uh, the bod the oxygen which is actually there which is for the aquatic uh, marine or aquatic uh, uh, beings like fish or you know those kind of solutions you know can you really look at uh, remote uh, monitoring using wireless sensors wireless linked sensors so these are some of the simple solutions and similarly like you mentioned about floods in mumbai can we really look at monitoring areas which are likely to get inundated when there is a, a, a unprecedented rainfall like what happened in 2005 in mumbai or what happened in chennai in 2010 can we really look at uh, monitoring rainfall patterns at hyper local weather and then find solutions so these are possibilities yeah if i can add uh, if if it is okay uh, yeah, yeah, uh, kavi if i can add to that without taking too much uh, the thing the thing common between disaster management and agriculture is where disaster strikes agriculture there is a loss of crop and when there is a loss of crop 
there is a farm insurance which gets triggered and i think the current farm insurance mechanisms are a complete disaster right nothing seems to be working and the reason that it isn't working is that when uh, let's say for example a crop is destroyed or shortfall of rain it needs to be verified okay now this farm is in the middle of some taluka in some district in some village somewhere right how do you verify that the th trick is that that's the how do you kind of get technology using sensors satellite data to verify that is where the you know the intersection of disaster management and agriculture can happen right now what happens in uh, for agricultural insurance is that there is a person who has to physically go to that area and check how much of the crop has been destroyed what is the yield etc now where there is a person involved in the rural areas it always becomes subjective what happens then the politics comes in the either the political leader in that uh, area kind of influences the person to kind of uh, you know declare a disaster which is greater than what actually happened or the insurance companies will tell him to kind of cut it down so neither party is happy but if we can develop a technological solution which uses satellite data plus distributed sensors across the region to combine with uh, the weather data and use data processing and machine learning to kind of identify patterns through which we can predict this that would be a fantastic solution actually crop insurance is a parametric solution which is attempted based on rainfall rainfall parameters but you actually can come up with solutions which can look at uh, helping the farmer in advance by looking at uh, the data of not only rainfall but also the susceptibility of that particular farm to have excess rainfall which can happen again based on contours again based on you know the geo geomorphology the hydromorphology the cropping pattern which is there is it a water intensive crop or is it a a low water water intensive crop is it dependent on rainfall totally so these are some of the parameters which may also come in uh, we know this is very interesting and i think i'll i'll invite lohit here to say a bit because i think he is working in this space lohit this might be a good idea for you to perhaps even guide a few uh, teams to come up with some 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 interesting innovations because this is what is interesting that you have microclimate models so you can know what the climate is in a particular farm because our farms are very small they are about 1 2 acres and stuff like that the satellite imagery is very coarse it covers one pixel could be 5 acres or more so lohit do you have anything to say about this Uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, Sri Ram sir did mention about a company called Cropin. Uh, I've been uh, going to that website right now. Uh, it's interesting what they're doing, and uh, uh, like uh, rightly said by Kavi sir that right now the problem with satellite imagery is uh, the uh, spatial resolution, and that is where I'm trying to bridge uh, by introducing some kind of sensing. in field so that that will add on to the uh, information that is missing uh, with respect to satellite uh, information so that's a nice space that one can uh, actually look at and that's what i am also looking at currently uh, so this is just a small problem as uh, shriram sir said it's agriculture it's a, there's a lot of things that you can do in this space and i'm just trying to address one small issue uh, with the agriculture space itself but lohit i think the interesting thing here is how to come up with a microclimate model because that can have impact on many many different things including flood prediction right of uh, fine resolution uh, flood prediction so i think this trying to trace what the effect of rainfall will be on a particular geography is very important because it can cause a disaster in a say village or a town like in pune itself a few years ago there were very bad floods which which uh, destroyed a lot of property so this whole thing so someone is asking here right um good afternoon sir this is nitesh uh, kumar 
why choose disaster management project my simple answer is to make lots of money <laughs> right because we are looking at opportunities for for creating technology for creating businesses creating startups which can solve people's problems and ideally make you lots of money because if you are making lots of money obviously the problem is an important one and it's impacting more people so the more people the problem impacts the more money you will make <laughs> so that is a simple answer to that but there's also if you do it in the spirit of you know helping society and all that then that makes your startup or your, your idea more meaningful and well intentioned and uh, so that's my answer to uh, nitish kumar sujal says that she is uh, she's uh, pursuing or is it a he um, uh, in extc in his third year in uh, st francis institute of technology so he's asking whether our epidemic outbreaks typically considered within the scope of disaster management strategies over to you vinod right actually epidemics and pandemics now the global pandemic covid-19 is a part of uh, what is called chemical biological radiological and nuclear emergencies cbr and emergencies epidemics actually because uh, these are uh, sometimes water born or vector born diseases actually also can become really an epidemic uh, hepatitis b for instance or some of these things are actually very important that you know you need to really look at early warning so we have a uh, a disease control a disease surveillance uh, system which actually can uh, really look at early warning but sometimes you know you find sudden outbreaks happening like right now there is a nipah virus outbreak in kerala where two people have died but uh, there are also a people who few people who have got infected and there are 950 people have been in the contact of people who are already infected you know so which means basically contact tracing becomes important so epidemiology is actually also early detection and early response is a solution so how do you really make sure that uh, these early warnings can be detected so we know this is very interesting uh, i'd like to just highlight this again there uh, someone just spoke to me yesterday wanting to work with young people to devise a system where they can monitor uptake of drugs through monitoring prescriptions at uh, chemist outlets to know what kind of disease is happening where now if students are interested in this kind of thing maybe i'll uh, i i will connect them to this uh, gentleman and maybe four or five teams can be working on this kind of idea but this whole idea of of uh, of predicting and tracking epidemics is a fascinating idea right as to how one can do it one can do it by monitoring hospital records one can do it by monitoring drugs which are being uh, uh, prescribed in particular um, areas or or wards of a city like mumbai there are various indicators of epidemics or 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 things that let you predict epidemics also maybe okay like in 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 uh, pest attack prediction what they do in in uh, in agriculture is they monitor humidity temperature and uh, pressure and through machine learning models you can predict what kind of pests are going to attack your crops and take the appropriate precautions because what people do is that they tend to spray pesticides too much this will let you optimize your spraying of uh, pesticide and so on so this is a bcom student i think uh, megna uh, paletti uh, wanted to know about past uh, projects which have been done in this area i think we look at our records rohit maybe we can share what are the projects which have been done uh, in the past which have come to the regionals and the finals and this can give uh, people ideas any other questions before we wind up hello so yeah okay so i think this has been extremely useful um i got a lot out of this interaction today and uh, i would like to thank uh, both our guests here uh, professor vinod menon and shriram patasarthi we are very grateful for the amount of time that they spent with us and we are grateful for the 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 you know without hesitation that they come and spend time with us 
it is very gratifying and it's 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 something that we really appreciate it makes us feel that what we are also doing is meaningful so we are very hopeful now with this kind of interaction to uh, the kind of outcome that this this innovation challenge is going to have and i'd like to hand over the floor here to my colleague so we i'd like to thank our yantra team which is managing the entire show starting with lohit who's leading the charge with uh, the yantra innovation challenge lohit is a project staff at yantra he's also doing his phd in this area of 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 agriculture related to what we are looking at dr veena has joined us recently and she'll be looking after this uh, next year so i'd like to hand the floor over to her to give her impression of what she believes has happened today and to wrap up uh, today's uh, the program over to you veena thank you kavi sir um so good afternoon to uh, everyone present here so first of all i would like to thank a special thanks to vinod menon sir as well as shri ram parthasarthi sir who accepted our invitation on a short notice and uh, made this interaction happen um so like how um, when we say about a disaster so it depends on a on a person's perspective basically so to me a disaster means immediately the rainfall is something that comes to my mind the floods and the recent pandemic that happened so uh, it depends and it varies from person to person so uh, professor vinod menon he brought, he shed a light on different types of disasters so we need to think out of the box and what uh, shri ram parthasarathy sir mentioned i was uh, a strong point that comes to my mind about what he mentioned is who is the person you are innovating for and for whom you are solving the problem which students definitely need to apply to their minds before choosing a problem i hope this interaction would have been so insightful to all the students and the faculties who have joined us and maybe that they will choose the problem uh, existing in each of these domains it's not just a theme there are many problem statements in each of these themes and uh, special thanks to our professor kavi arya who took forward this discussion and uh, many of many wonderful brainstorming happened through this and uh, it was so insightful and thanks to our yantra team especially lohit sir deepa uh, shri venkateshwar who had joined us here and also to all the other yantra team members who have could have joined on the youtube live uh, and thanks to all the participants uh, especially the students and the teachers who have joined us and have showered your questions here please do uh, write to us if you have any further questions to eyic.e-yantra.org which is the website and eyic at at the rate e-yantra.com and um, just reminding you the registrations for uh, yantra innovation challenge 2023-24 is already on and the registrations end on september 29th yes. i'd like to just i'd like to just interrupt before we end i noticed a veteran of many competitions here in the audience with us sanjeevni chakote who's a faculty at at rait and every year she brings a bunch of her students to this uh, competition and the students have gone on after that to win smart india hackathon and all sorts of things uh, sanjeevni do you have any uh, feedback for us if you are there uh, about uh, what you got out of this uh, session good evening sir am i audible to you yes you are audible but not visible okay oh, just wait a minute sir i hope Am I visible to you now, sir? Yes, you are. You can go ahead. Yeah, actually, it's a good to arrange that kind of uh, interaction so that the faculty and students will come to know the problem statement, and it's easy to find out the gap. Okay. So this is coming from you, who fielded many, many student teams at this Yantra Innovation Challenge. So I'm glad you found it useful, and. Uh, I look forward to having more interactions with yourself and other faculty who want to have ideas about these kind of things. Uh, so thank you very much. So we are uh, we are Kavi, equally in. Kavi, I just yeah. men mentioned in the chat that the yes. Time Hundred, uh, which has just been published uh, last week, mentioned mm -hmm. uh, 